Welcome back to Kansas City. We are in video number four of our history of level funding. How we got from distributed chickens for care all the way to today where we have a overly complicated, very nuanced, crazy set of solutions that have come together that have built something that we call level funded. Today we're going to talk about four of the solutions that are in infancy or nascency where they are looking to grow, they are looking to provide additional value to the consumers of Level Funded out there, and a lot of brokers who have been in Level Funding have at least heard the terms, whether or not they're currently working with them. Uh, that's up to the individual broker and their unique marketplace, the clients they serve. So, if we remember back to the other videos, we started with Indemnity, which begot HMOs, which begot PPOs. And Still to this day, there's very few indemnity players, but there are some indemnity players out there. There are a number of HMOs and there are a plethora of PPOs out there. There are next level solutions that are coming down the channel uh, that have been in the marketplace for just a little bit that we're gonna talk about today. And there are four. Four solutions that are driving down the cost of delivering a health plan to small group employers inside of the current structure. Not changing the entire structure, but inside of the current structure. We're gonna talk about the most popular one first and we're gonna roll down the list. The first one we're gonna chat about is RBP. Some people call it RBR, um, some people call it MOM or multiple of Medicare, and who doesn't like mom? <laughs> but RBP is the general name for it. It's called reference-based pricing. Factor number one, Inherent problem of basing a discount off of a number that's not tied to reality, right? The charge master is a fictitious one. A lot of hospital administrators have a very difficult time defending it. That's why the PPO discounts in general, hey, you get 50% off charge master. Seems like a great deal. But if you're selling a service and you want to make more money, you just increase the original price and the 50% becomes illusionary at best, right? And the second piece, this is a little bit more big brained but it will make sense once I explain it, is under the, I believe it was the Clinton administration, they had a piece where they changed the Medicare reimbursements. Every year they estimated the inflation and then would change the reimbursements based on that. Lo and behold, every year they estimate inflation lower than it actually comes in. Now that benefits the single payer, that benefits the government, right? That benefits Medicare, Medicaid, but it hurts the hospital systems. So as you have your largest payer paying you less and you have no, if you're a hospital, you have no ability to negotiate, you have the same pie, what are you gonna do? You're gonna charge the private pay sector more money, right? That discrepancy between medical trend and the CPI that they compute with, most years is somewhere between two and 7%. That means that there's a bigger and bigger price discrepancy over time between what the government says I'm gonna pay you and what the hospital administrators have wanted in the past. Whether they're entitled to it or not, that's a completely separate conversation. So what RBP does is it says, all right, first of all, we're not happy with the first part of the conversation, which is the PPOs giving illusionary discounts. All right, we're gonna tie it to something that is much more based in reality. And that is the uh, payment accepted from their largest client is paid in full. Right? So RBP comes in and says, all right, if the government pays $20,000 for this service, we're gonna pay, instead of provider, in general, 150% of that. So we're gonna pay $30,000, right? We're gonna cover that bubble, which is the difference between what you charge the private sector and what you charge the government. And we're gonna pay you quickly we're gonna cut out all the bureaucracy. We're gonna cut out a bunch of the PEPM fees that are on side of it just to get access to the PPO discounts. And we're gonna cut you check quickly, right? Hospitals don't necessarily have to take this. They can fight you on it. This is a solution that is noisy, to borrow a term. Now it's, it's not perfect, it's not imperfect, it just is trade-offs. You can buy a plan with these widgets in it, right? The RBP widget. But realize it's not a perfect solution, right? You're buying a little bit of noise in two factors, denial of access to care and balance billing, which your members are gonna be exposed to the administrators of the hospital, which can be monsters, right? So there's gonna be a bit of a disconnect for the average em employee 
when they see that their hospital is actually not all guys in white coats. Uh, there are also some um, fairly aggressive finance guys that run those shops. So that's solution number one. Solution number two says, okay, well, Mr. Hospital Administrator, let's quit fighting. Let's set up a thing called an EPO or a direct contract. And what that says is we're going to base this off of either a greater discount off of Charge Master, so we're back in line with where it should be, or we're going to base this off of RBP, so we're ballasted for the long term, so this can be a long term relationship for steerage. If you remember back to the first videos, we were talking about ste steerage and Topeka, Kansas, the railroads pumping people in, right? This is a modern way to do it for very small markets. In my opinion, this is something very beautiful. If done right, you can change a couple of counties at a time. Yes, it doesn't scale. Yes, it's labor intensive, but oh my gosh, is it beautiful when it's done well. The EPO is a contract with a provider or just a couple providers to take care of the people in a small community. You cut out the Wall Street mentality, you cut out the large fees and you say, no, these are my people. I'm taking care of them in this area. And for that, I'm going to get steerage from them. And they're going to, uh, from me, they're going to get great care at a reduced cost, right? That's a beautiful solution. And it's popping up around the country. It's newer than RBP. RBP has been around for a long time, but really in the forefront for about five years. These EPO systems are maybe a year, year and a half old uh, from my desk at scale. Direct contracts have been around before that. Another option uh, is one called DPC. This is option number three. We've been talking about on RBP and EPO, we've been talking about the providers, but there's a whole other element to it. Those are the doctors, right? So think hospitals as providers, doctors, right? Frontline, catastrophic. The catastrophic stuff, we get it, it's tough. Frontline stuff is actually where most people interact with the healthcare system. And the doctors, the guys in the white coats, they're pretty good folks, right? Most people are pretty good folks. If you keep the finance guys out of the conversation, you're going to have a better time, right? So what DPC does is it cuts out the finance guys. It cuts out the guys who are driving only efficiency, saying, I want the doctor to see 10 patients an hour, or you have six minutes with a person to prescribe and work through all their problems. It's a suboptimal solution. And that goes back to that Another, these are all references back to things we've talked about under Truman when you had the AMA and the fee for service rather than fee for maintenance, right? So with the DPC, what you end up having is a relationship with the doctor that cuts out the back office, cuts out the hospitals, cuts out the Wall Street mentality and says, all right, I'm a doctor. I'm not going to see 10 patients an hour. That is not service. That is a factory farm for doctors. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, I'm going to take 500 people. That's what I'm going to take care of this year. And for that, they're going to pay me a fee. And whether that's 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month, it depends. But those members, whenever they have a call, they can call the doctor. Whenever they want to be seen, they can go in and be seen. It changes the relationship from one of maximizing profits to one of relationship based. It's not perfect. It's newer. There's some tax problems with it, but it is another one that is uh, shaking up things in our industry in a good way. We'll see how it grows, but it's something beautiful. And there's another big, big benefit to it, which is all of the low end pharmaceuticals. You can get those from your doctor and he'll give them to you at low or very close to wholesale. Um, so think the 300 most prescribed he'll keep in his office. You don't have to go to the pharmacy, it makes it easier and it reduces the dispensing fee from the pharmacy. So there's another beautiful part of DPC. Uh, again, it's one of the four things that are really shaking out our industry, um, but it brings it to the fourth one, which started, in my opinion, on RX, um, and that is tourism. Now, before you say, Tom, that's crazy, it's growing. It's growing big time. There is a massive price discrepancy in the United States between, and everybody knows about pharmaceuticals, but for pharmaceuticals in the US to Canada, it's roughly a five to one cost difference. So if you go to Canada and you pick up a drug up there, it's, it depends on the drug, you know, but it's roughly five times more expensive than the States. So 
with Kathleen Sebelius when she was secretary of HHS, she, and I believe this is right, she said we're not going to enforce personal reimportation of a 90-day supply or less. So if, if grandma goes to Canada to get uh, 90 days worth of insulin, that's going to be non-enforced, right? That's as I currently see the law. So you can use that as mail order, and there's some interpretations of that that are beautiful, that allow people to take advantage of a lower cost structure, right? Don't subsidize Wall Street or subsidize the pharmaceutical companies. Whole drugs in the U.S., the exact same drugs, right? And get them at a lower cost. You're also seeing growth of international surgeries, right? These are, again, more aggressive, uh, but you're seeing it growth, uh, you're seeing growth from American trained doctors delivering American style medicine inside of countries like Costa Rica, Colombia, Turkey. Your spouse will get a vacation, you get a new hip, um, you're there for two weeks and you have a great time in the rainforest, but you have a great hospital, right? And it's cheaper. So it's, it's taking the situation saying, all right, we have artificial constraints inside of the US, right? We have a massive subsidy to R&D inside of the US where we produce the R&D for the entire planet. Now, these other countries that have socialized their medicine, they don't do the same R&D, right? There's something beautiful about our model and that it innovates, but there's something terrible about our model and that we're the only ones paying for it. So these solutions come out and try to provide another way of looking at things that provide a little bit of market accountability, right? We live in a complex world, but by utilizing level funding and utilizing different mechanisms inside of it, we can hold the disconnect between our regulatory structure and reality in slight check. And if we do that long enough and well enough, we will force the regulatory change that will bring market-based incentives, market-based treatments back to the front fold away from the crony capitalistic system that we currently have. And we can solve a little bit of America's problems by what's right in America. I hope you've enjoyed this history of level funding. It is a microcosm of what we're fighting for and fighting with for the next 50 years in employee benefits uh, in this country. My name is Tom Stein. We are American Trust Administrators. Thanks for paying attention. If you have questions, let me know. If you think I screwed something up, I'm all ears. Uh, I'm here to learn and uh, we'll see you out there. Thanks again.